Welcome to week 10 of my life as a CTC cadet pilot and to the first week of module 2, roll titles. So, as I said, week 10, very first week of Module 2, and we've gone straight in with radio navigation and instruments for our first week back. So, it's been a pretty full-on week, so much so, actually, that uh, I'm recording this on the following week, on the Monday, because I spent the whole weekend rewriting up all of my notes. As a matter of fact, I'll just go and get my folder. When I say it's been a full-on week, new folder, that's all my notes, so, yeah, busy, 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 no hanging around, so, like I said, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, we have started radio navigation, which is considered to be a fairly large topic, as usual, got a list of things here of what I've covered, so, radio navigation, uh, first thing's pretty obvious, it's, uh, we're going to be studying about radio waves. And essentially, they've got amplitude, they've got frequency, and you can generate them you, by, using a, by passing an electrical current through a wire. Uh, you can actually modulate the waves, like I said, uh, AM, FM, which stands for amplitude and frequency modulation. And there's lots of different types of aerials that you can use. Um, we study them in, in more depth, in particularly in instruments and how we use them. Uh, one of the things that we look at is how the different types of waves propagate and attenuate through the atmosphere. So, for example, a low frequency wave will have good long range capabilities, but they are usually very poor quality and take uh, high frequency for example quality is not so good but the advantage with high frequency is you can actually use the ionosphere to bounce your radio signal around the planet so it's not considered a line of sight wave like VHF communications that's generally considered to be more of a line of sight wave good quality and very good for short range but not very good at long long range communication so like I just mentioned aircraft communications we use VHF for short range high frequency for long range and if we want to get a higher quality uh, long range signal out we can use something called SATCOM which stands for satellite communication which I believe uses ultra high frequency waves so that's quite a modern system now as far as I'm aware uh, one of the other things we can use uh, radio waves for is in what stands a VDF, which stands for VHF Direction Finding. This is something that you can use in the air traffic control tower. You can call up and say, I don't know, QDM, 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 and the air traffic control will be able to give you a bearing from what you've requested. Uh, on top of VDF, we've studied in extreme detail how to use NDVs and how they work. I'm a bit surprised that we have to study them in so much detail considering how old the system is and that it is one of the systems that is now being phased out. I mean, it's very rare for a commercial pilot to use an NDB. I know when I did my PPL, there was only one NDB that I ever used, and that was at South End, which, to be brutally honest, the only reason why I used it was because it was there. I just fancied using the instrument. But there are plenty of other better ways of uh, trying uh, getting a bearing. Um, one of the ways of doing doing that is using a VOR, which stands for V VHF again, and then it's omni range, omni short for omnidirectional. And this works on com doing phase comparison. I know the older VOR beacons. Uh, basically use what my instructor describes as a spinning dustbin which would go around 30 times a second and using the phase comparison between that and a reference signal you can work out where you are but the more modern systems for example a Doppler VOR uh, that swaps the modulations around 
But yeah, I mean, I won't go into too much detail, but in short, you can use uh, an instrument in your aircraft, so an OBI, RMI, or HSI if you're lucky. And from that, you can get a radial from or to a, B, a VOR. Only problem with uh, NDB and VORs are they have something what's known as a cone of confusion, which means if you're pretty much over the top of it, it will not work. So what else have we got to cover? Oh, coming back to the NDB, there's two types, and you've got en route and locator. Locator being short range, generally used around airports, en route. Pretty self-explanatory, really. So, yeah, in a nutshell, we've covered quite a bit in radio navigation. I mean, what I've just explained to you is just a small sprinkle of what's happened in one week. But I say one week, that's only three days worth. we still got Thursday and Friday, which is instruments, which I also have a list of things for. So, instruments... Um, Last week I said that's considered to be one of the easier topics. Um, yeah, I'd say it's a little less easy than I thought. There's a lot of detail on how the instruments work that we have to cover. So, example of instruments, we've got airspeed indicators, artificial horizon, altimeters, turn indicators, directional indicators, vertical speed indicators, Mach meters, the list goes on, there's an instrument for everything. And uh, those of you who've got PPLs are probably familiar with the uh, traditional six pack, which is the six circular instruments. And they just give you your basic information to fly the aircraft. But if you're lucky and you've got the extra money, you can invest in a glass cockpit system, which takes these six instruments and integrates them into essentially a like having an iPad instead of a instrument system. It's not the best explanation that, but basically it's glass cockpit. If you don't know it's just Google it. But yeah, the good thing about the glass cockpit is, even though it's a little bit more expensive, there's a lot more things you can do with it, and a lot more freedom you have with the glass cockpit, so you can move things around, so you can tailor it to each pilot. Although we've been advised that the airlines don't generally allow pilots to fiddle around with their glass cockpit systems. But uh, let's have a look. So how do we these instruments work? Well, a lot of them rely on what's known as pressure sensing. And there's two main instruments for pressure sensing. Uh, the pitot tube, which measures the air coming into the front of the aircraft. And that will give you total pressure. But there's also, on the side of the aircraft, is a static uh, port. And as the name implies, that measures static pressure. Now, if you take total pressure and minus static pressure, you get dynamic pressure. So from that, you can work out, for example, your airspeed, if you combine the two. But just your altimeter, for example, that relies on just the static port, just the, no, yeah. Take the vertical speed indicator, for example, it measures the change in static pressure. I won't go into detail about how the instruments work in great detail. This video will be an hour long. Um, other things that we studied, the Mach meter, I think I've said already, um, angle of attack indicators. Um, this is relatively young, I believe, the angle of attack indicator. I've never actually flown in an aircraft with one. But one of the things that the AOA does is it tells you what your angle of attack is. And for most uh, commercial aircraft, the stalling angle of attack is 16 degrees. So if you can see you're up at like 12, 13, 14 degrees, you're starting to think, hmm, getting a bit near the store, I should probably reduce my angle of attack. But obviously with the, all these instruments and pressure sensing equipment, there's a lot of errors that can occur, and that is one of the items that we have to study. So for example, in the compass, in the copy, we use what's known as a directional indicator, but that's only useful if it's set correctly from a compass. Now the problem with the compass, it's not very easy to read it. It's only reliable if you're straight and level and not accelerating, which is why we use a directional indicator. It's more reliable and it's much easier to read and less susceptible to turbulence. Ah, here we go. So we actually studied something very interesting, um, gyroscopes. For those who don't know what a gyroscope is, again, you can Google it if you want, but essentially it's just a spinning mass 
And if you spin it fast enough, you can get some very interesting properties. For example, gyroscopes, once they're past a certain speed, they will be very stable. But the interesting thing about them is, is that they have something called precession, which basically means you can apply a force to a gyroscope and it will do something completely different. I'm going to put a video on screen shortly that shows you this. For so our instructor, he brought in a gyroscope, pretty expensive, I think it was like 80 quid. So it was a pretty decent gyroscope. And well, I'll put it on screen now. So here you can see the gyroscope's going round and round and round. Now, that is floating, it's not very obvious. So as you can see now, the instructor picks it up, puts it back down. And now it looks like the gyroscope is doing some form of magic. There's no way that that is naturally standing there by itself. But that's just how gyroscopes work. They work on stability and precession. That's what's keeping that up. As soon as that stops spinning, that will just fall over. So, what are gyroscopes used for? Well, they're used in a lot of our instruments, which is why we're studying them. For example, in the artificial horizon, You've got to keep, if you're in straight and level, you don't want the artificial horizon moving around. You want it to stay in the correct position. So if you climb, you want that gyro to stay in the same position. But as the aircraft moves around it, you can see an indication of, oh, I've gone 10 degrees nose up, for example. It's used in other instruments, such as the directional indicator. Actually, it's called a directional gyro. I get told off for calling it a directional indicator. So that's uh, pretty much instruments all summed up. So what did I get up to at the weekend? As I said, this is being recorded on the following Monday. So it's obvious I've not had time to record this video over the weekend. Now, why is that? Well, like I said, red folder. There's a lot in that for one week. And uh, that's not my notes that I write in class. These are my notes that I write up after class in the and ready for studying for the exams. Unfortunately, that does take quite a long time. I think uh, out of the five working days in the evenings, I was putting about three to four hours in each night. And then over the weekend, if you don't include food shopping and sleeping, I spent all but probably about two hours of my time going over for everything and rewriting my notes. This is one of the things I learned from Mod 1. Don't get behind on writing your notes. As a matter of fact, that's some of the advice I've been giving to some of the members of our new CP that have started this week at CTC. So hopefully that'll be some advice that's been taken seriously because I know what it's like. I, I know when I started in Mod 1, I got a week behind on my notes and I never really caught up until near the exams. So. I feel like I'm on top of my notes now. Once I've uh, finished recording this video, I'm going to be writing up what I've been up to today, which is, as a matter of fact, uh, this week's schedule is the exact same as last week's. So three days of RNAV, neatly followed up by two days of instruments. So by the end of week 11, we should be pretty much finished on RNAV and about halfway through on instruments. So, video is getting a bit long now, so I'm going to wrap it all up. As always, thank you very much for watching. Feel free to like the video. Feel free to su I'll do that every time. Feel free to subscribe. I think I've actually got that right the last couple of weeks. Anyhow, feel free to, su to subscribe. Like the video, share it. You know all the usual draw you. If you've made it this in, this far into the series, you know the procedure. Anyhow, I'm rambling on, so I will see you next week in week 11. Take it easy. Bye-bye.